Hotel is a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. Godtel is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. Godtel is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. Godtel is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on in God tell. Well, it's been an interesting week. We've lost another goat, actually three, two babies and a mama. Not killed by dogs this time, killed by the daddy goat. Well, by the billy goat, it's not their daddy, and that's probably why I should have I know not to do that, and I didn't think about it. You don't put a pregnant in with a different daddy because then the daddy wants to kill the babies, but in this particular instance, he killed both of them. People say, why do they do that? That's because they're animals. Cats do the same thing. A male cat will come along and new babies and kill all the babies to put the mother back into heat again. They're animals. People do the same thing, don't they? Killed a lot of babies in this country. <clears throat> well, here we are. Finally got to Melchizedek. And we are in chapter 7 of Hebrews. Yeah. Discussing God's eternal priesthood. I've divided it up into sections. We'll read it first and then we'll come back and see what we can get through with. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation the king of righteousness, and after this also the king of Salem, which is a king of peace, without father, without mother, without descendant, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch <clears throat> Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Verily, they that are of the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, through though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted for them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises." And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And there, and here men that die receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. And as I may say so, or so say, Levi also, who received the tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If, therefore, perfection were by Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek, and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity of necessity, a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. <clears throat> and it is yet far more evident that for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest, who is made not after the law or of a car carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life, for he testifies, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment, going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made a priest, for the priests were made without an oath, but 
This with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continues ever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. <clears throat> For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needs not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. <clears throat> for the law makes men high priests which have infirmities, but the word of the oath which was since the law makes the Son who is consecrated forevermore. Now let's go back to verse 1. <clears throat> the first section is verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> Melchizedek is identified in verses 1 through 3. Who is this man, El Melchizedek? Now there's some scholars, some that are considered very great scholars, who have erred because they say that Melchizedek was just a man and he had a father and a mother, but the Bible says he did. Listen, I don't care how great a scholar is or how many degrees he has uh, <clears throat> or how much money he's gotten because he's so great and written all these books and everything. You do not contradict God's word. I don't care. God says this man had no father and no mother. He had no descendants, no offspring. He had none before him, none after him. He had no beginning of days. He, he's eternal. He had no end of days. He has no breaks in the middle. He is forever. You have to understand that God, down through the ages, has appeared on earth in many different forms. No, too many people don't have a problem with him showing up as a bush. They don't have too much trouble saying he's a rock, followed the children of Israel through the wilderness. Oh, they can even get by with the man with the drawn sword, you know, at Jericho. But for some reason, they don't want to see that Melchizedek is the same person. Melchizedek was the high priest of Salem, which became Jerusalem, also known as the king of peace, the king of righteousness. Now, <clears throat> Jesus was called when he came the Prince of Peace. Now, there's a reason for that. Remember, he was also called the Son of God. But he actually is God, and he actually is the King of Peace. But these are metaphors for us to understand the nature of God. The Father is identified as the King. The Son would be what? Prince. The Prince. Until such time as he replaces the Father, then he becomes King. When Jesus went back to heaven after the ascension, all things were surrendered to him, and he was king again, king of kings and lord of lords. While he was on earth, he, if you wanted to say, played the role of the son of God. But it's the same person. And in this particular instance, he is a priest, Melchizedek. He was the high priest. It says here he was the priest of the most high God. He was the priest of priests, with a big P. And <clears throat> so Jesus was made a priest after the order of Melchizedek, which means he was made a priest after his own order. Because Jesus is God. What's higher than God? Well, nothing. So you can't make him a priest after some uh, organization or something like the Levitical priesthood. They were priests on earth, and they had to keep being substituted because they kept dying off. But Jesus doesn't ever die. And see, people don't understand this because they say, well, he went to the cross and he died. Yes, the body of Jesus experienced death. It died. But the God that was inside him never ceased to exist. He cannot die. If he could die, he wouldn't be God. Because somebody would kill him and get rid of him. Back years ago, there was a very famous atheist who came up with the God is dead theory. God is dead. God is dead. 
I think his name was Voltaire or something like that, wasn't it, Nancy? Nietzsche. Nietzsche, that's right, Nietzsche. I knew you'd straighten me out. <laughs> She's just waiting for that opportunity. <laughs> Nietzsche. <laughs> and Nietzsche said, God is dead. Well, one day there was a college student, and he was seen with a T-shirt on that said, God is dead. It was signed Nietzsche. As he kept walking along, on the back it said, Nietzsche is dead, and it was signed God. <laughs> <laughs> you can't kill God. If you could kill him, he wouldn't be God. And so you need to understand, he provided himself with this body, but then after the resurrection, he's still identified in that body, but he is God. He is everything that God could ever possibly in all of eternity ever mean to mankind, ever, or to anything else in the universe, whatever else happens to be out there, maybe little green men with great big eyes, I don't know. So, and, and Abraham wasn't called Abraham until after this story about him meeting Melchizedek and paying the tithes. He was known as Abram. After that, God changed his name to Abraham, uh, the father of many nations. But Paul, you remember, was writing this after Abraham's name was changed. So he just calls him Abraham. But some people get nitpicky and say, well, he wasn't called Abraham there. Well, no, he wasn't, except that Paul was writing after he had had his name changed to Abraham. And it wasn't to disguise him. God wasn't ashamed of him or anything. In fact, Abraham was called a friend of God. He wasn't a perfect man. He was a friend of God. So Abraham tithed when he came back from the slaughter of the kings, and uh, he won this war. He took his men. He had 300 and something men. And then the other guys from the other cities came out. But Abraham kind of took over and was in charge, came up with the battle tactics and whooped the enemy. And when he came back, he met Melchizedek on the plains of Mamre and he gave 10% of all the spoil to Melchizedek. <clears throat> no father, no mother, no descent, no beginning of days, no end of life. Made like unto the Son of God. He abides a priest, how long? Forever. Continually, forever. So verses 1 through 3 are identity. Verses 1 through 10 talk about his greatness. Now consider how great this man was unto whom the patriarch, now the first time I read that I thought it said partridge. You know the partridge family? You know. And so I read that unto whom even the partridge, Abraham, you know, <laughs> There's a lot of words in the Bible I didn't understand for a long time because I, I mis, would misspell them, mispronounce them. <clears throat> anyway, the patriarch, Abraham, gave a tenth of the spoil. And verily, they that are the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have the commandment. They take tithes. God commanded them to take tithes of the people. That's how God's church was supposed to operate. All the members of the church are supposed to give 10% of their gross income to the church. And folks, a lot of people are stingy. They're not going to ever do that. But what they don't understand is they will actually get by on less as though it were more if they would just give what God told them to. God always makes sure of that. Nancy and I found that out the hard way. We were barely feeding our family on the $30 a week I was making. Of course, this was back in the dark ages. And uh, I was working at the newspaper office, the Daily Senile, <laughs> Daily, Daily Sentinel, and um, we got in church and we, we started hearing about tithing. We started reading the scriptures about tithing. And that meant I was supposed to give $3 a week to the church. And I felt a little embarrassed. I thought, well, that's kind of silly. There's people in there with lots of money, you know. But that's not the issue. And so I start, we, we got together and started praying about it. We decided the right thing to do was to start tithing. As I said, we were barely feeding our, we had two kids at the time, barely making the ends meet at all, paying $12.15 a month rent, $12.50, went up to $15, $15 a month rent. And uh, <clears throat> we just didn't know how we were going to make it. But we made a decision that we would go ahead and do what God told us to do. And it's amazing, and I don't know how to explain this to you, but we did better on $27 than we did on 30 we don't know how. If I could ever figure that out, I'd bottle it and sell it. I'd be on television. I'd, I'd be talking about keeping new cards and letters coming in, folks, you know. <clears throat> and it wasn't very long after that, 
that uh, God gave me a better job. And we went from $30 a week to making $150 a week, plus they gave us two and a half dozen eggs every week, <laughs> which was way more than we could eat. We started giving those away along with our tithing, plus praying about other things to give. Because, you know, it's really weird, but when you have $30 a week and you tithe $3 a week, you've got 27 When you make $150 a week and you tithe, that's $15. So how much you got left? $135. How way more. God knows what to do. But then God started asking us or telling us to start praying about giving to other things besides the tithing. And so we started giving to other things. But in all of it, the more we gave, the more we always ended up with. And we never could figure out how. We still can't to this day. You know, we're always giving. And then we don't know, but we keep getting more. I don't know how it keeps happening. I would like to know. Maybe God will tell me someday, you know. But uh, I've been asking for 40 years and I haven't found out yet. All he ever says is, just trust me, it'll be okay. And it always is. <clears throat> so they take tithes of the people. They were commanded to do that. Now, by the way, <clears throat> you need to understand this. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Tithing is law. So you really haven't started giving when you just give 15% or 10% rather. Excuse me, a tithe 10% away. You haven't started giving. You just come up to ground zero where you can start giving. Most people don't understand that principle either. The tithe is just what God commands us to give. It has nothing to do with you seeing needs out there and having to meet them and stuff like that. Nothing to do with that at all. It's just what comes off the top, and that's what God intended to support his churches. Right now in the Southern Baptist Convention, I read recently, a while back, that only 2%, 2% of the people in the Southern Baptist, 14 million Southern Baptists, only 2% tithe. Should be 100%. All the members should tithe, but only 2% tithe. And they, they don't tithe 10% anymore. They tithe all in between, whatever they feel like giving. They call it a tithe. Put a $1.50 in the offering plate and call it a tithe. You know, I made $1,000 last year. I put a $1.50 in the offering plate. That's my tithe. Well, it's not. You know, should have put $100 in there. But people have gotten greedy, and even Christians, or people that call themselves Christians, they've gotten very greedy. They want stuff. Everybody wants stuff. <clears throat> so this is according to law, it says there in verse 5. The tithe was, tithe was according to law. We don't live according to law. We live according to grace. Amen. So law just brings us up to grace. That's all it does. <clears throat> verse 6, those who are not descendants are not counted from them received the tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. He whose descent is not counted is Melchizedek. He received the tithe from Abraham. And even though he was the one that gave Abraham the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed by the better. You notice it uses better. In the previous chapter, chapter 6, verse 16, it used the word greater. A man can be in a greater position than you, but he's no better than you. Because he's not better by nature. But Christ is better by nature. That's why that word is used better. The less is better, blessed by the better, and the better was Jesus himself. And here, men that die receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness, he never dies. He never dies. <clears throat> Levi. The tribe of Levi, the priests, they received tithes. But they also paid tithes in Abraham because they were still in his loins. Now, starting in verse 11, we have a contrast between law and grace. For if perfection or salvation, that's what he's talking about here. If salvation could come by Levitical priesthood, you know, all those offerings they made and the animals they killed uh, for forgiveness of sin... Those things never took away sin, never. But that's what they thought they were doing. And all those things really did was look forward to the time when Christ would come and die and pay the penalty once for all. 
So if the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood that is, could bring about salvation, <clears throat> what further need was there of another priest that should arise after the order of Melchizedek? Well, if they could bring salvation, then there wouldn't be a need. But they couldn't. So they were called after the order of Aaron. And you know what amazes me? The Jewish people, they have the Old Testament. And they should have the New Testament. There's no reason why they can't believe the New Testament. But they refuse to. And they want to go back to their sacrificial system. That's why eventually the temple is going to be rebuilt. The altar is going to be rebuilt. And they're going to reinstitute the Levitical priesthood. And they're going to reinstitute the sacrifices of blood made like in the Old Testament. And it's sad because they could save themselves an awful lot of work if they would just receive Christ. And they're going to eventually. But in the meantime, the priesthood has been changed, verse 12. That means it's been changed from keeping the law to grace. It's not that the law is bad. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law is spiritual. The law is holy. But men have a problem keeping the law. That's why we needed grace. The law brings us to Christ. Christ gives us grace. The law is good and it should be emphasized. And you should see the difference between who you are and what the law says because that should let you know why you need Christ because the law says the soul that sins it shall die and if you look at the law it doesn't take too long before you go uh oh I'm a sinner and we all are even Nancy although she tries to not let on So the law brings us, it's our school teacher, Colossians chapter 1, 3, 3. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, it says, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Once we've come to Christ, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. I don't have to get up in the morning and wonder which laws I'm going to break today. I don't have to go to bed at the end of the night, and, well, I kept 2, 4, 6, and 8, broke 3, 5, 7, and 9, I'm a 50 percenter. I don't have to think about that. I live under grace. And when I sin, at that moment, I'm to go to Christ and ask for forgiveness. I don't have to wait till the end of the day. I don't have to wait for some priest to put on his robe and get in a little box and offer me indulgences and forgiveness and say words over me that they say to everybody, Bless you, my son. When was your last confession? Well, about five seconds ago, buddy. <laughs> if you're a Christian, and we don't have to hope that some priest is going to pray us into heaven because he can't even pray himself into heaven. I don't have to worry about going to purgatory because there is no such thing. you got one, two places you can go, heaven or hell, that's it. And you're not going to go to any middle place and then get prayed out of there by your relatives. <laughs> Just... well, we laugh, but folks, as the whole Catholic Church believes all that stuff. And I, I feel sorry for him. In fact, I was talking to Nancy. I said, you know, because we were, we were Catholic growing up, so I can talk about it. But there was a priest, uh, a pope, way, way back there. I don't know if it's the 12th century or before that. It was way back there. Maybe the second or third century. Anyway, he came up with an edict that said priests should be celibate. Now, he didn't get that out of the Bible. That's not in the Bible because they say Peter's their first pope and Peter had a mother-in-law. You can't have a mother-in-law without a wife. But they said oh, he was never married. Well, that's a lie. But they based that doctrine on that. And because of that, look what's happened to the Catholic Church down through the years. Some of the biggest sex scandals are where? In the Catholic Church. If they'd let the priests get married like they were supposed to, they wouldn't have had near such a big problem, would they? No, they wouldn't. Because of, it's not because of God that this happened. It's because of a man that did that. He exercised his power and authority in what his opinion was. And people followed him because he was the Pope. He was elected to be the Pope. Does that make him infallible? They say he's infallible. But he's not infallible. 
In fact, so many of the edicts they've come out with are not right. They're not biblical. They're based on tradition and what we have come to agree as a body is what we should do. I don't have to agree with anybody. I just go in this book. And anybody that goes in this book and reads it and seriously wants to know the truth, we're not going to have any problem agreeing. But it won't be because we got to a group and got a consensus. It's because we looked at God's word and said, I'm wrong and he's right. I'm going to do what he says. <clears throat> so the law changed. And it changed to offer us grace. That's God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. <clears throat> and he says, For whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. They had the altar. Did Melchizedek ever go over there? No. Did Jesus ever go into the Holy of Holies and offer a sacrifice? No, and he's the most qualified to do that. Now, after he died, he entered into the Holy of Holies, which is in the throne room of God, but not the one on earth. That's just for people. <clears throat> and the Lord sprang out of the tribe of Judah, and Moses never said there's any priest coming out of the tribe of Judah. we got a problem, man. But it is far more evidence for that after the similitude or the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest. And who is that? Jesus. He is a priest forever after the order or the similitude, the likeness of Melchizedek. The only question I really have is, God, why did you pick such a long name? Why don't you call him Steve? <laughs> after the order of Steve, that one has a nice ring to it, you know. Uh, you're Steve. You live forever. <laughs> Steve ain't got no father or mother. Hey, you know, even a redneck can handle that. But Melchizedek? Of course, in their language, Melchizedek might be the equivalent of Steve. <laughs> Mel. <laughs> Mel. We'll call him Mel. Who he's made, he's made not after the law or a carnal commandment, worldly, earthly commandment, man-made commandment or even God-made commandment on earth but after the power of an endless life why does he deserve to be the priest because he has an endless life what does it take to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek an endless life so the Mormons have a Melchizedek priesthood but it's false isn't it because it's not after the what it's not after an endless life that is the requirement to being a Melchizedek priest you have to have an endless life. No beginning, no end, no breaks in the middle. Well, they're priests, don't they? Die. And yet they call them Melchizedek priests. I think God's going to have a field day with some of these people on Judgment Day when he looks at them and says, Why do you take my name? Why do you take my name? It wasn't yours. Oh, of course, don't go to Mexico. You'll find a whole lot of Jesuses down there. <laughs> of course, they don't mean Jesus the Christ by that. It's just a name, a very common name. In fact, when Jesus was born, the name Jesus was a very common name there. And there's several Jesuses in the Bible that are mis mentioned, but they identify them by saying Jesus the son of, and they, you know, so you know it's not the same one. There's a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness of the unprofitableness thereof because the law made nothing perfect. The law could not save anyone. You cannot be saved by the law and yet there's people out there trying to be saved by the law, not just the Jewish people. You have Seventh-day Adventists. They, some of them believe that if you don't keep the Sabbath, you're going straight to hell. That's law, you know. And they're missing the point. Of course, they do silly things. One time I was preaching in a Seventh-day Adventist church. They invited me to preach on a Saturday because that's their Sabbath, although it is the Sabbath. We worship on the first day of the week, according to the New Testament. But anyway, I went there, and they were going to have a business meeting. But the service was over about 5, 5.15, and we had to sit around until 6 o'clock because they couldn't conduct business on the Sabbath. So we had to wait 45 minutes until it was 6 o'clock. That's considered the beginning of the new day. And then they could do their business. 
they want to do that, that's fine. But the problem comes in when they think that keeping these rules and regulations is going to get them saved. That's where the problem is. I mean, I don't care what day of the week you worship. I think if you're a Christian, you ought to worship every day. Morning, noon, and night. Even if it's just a little one. The law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. And with this better hope, we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not, verse 20, without an oath, a promise, he was made a priest. For those priests were made without a promise, they were made by law. The priesthood in the Levitical priesthood actually passed from father to son. It was by law. And only Levites could be priests. But this guy was made a priest, Jesus was made a priest, by a promise. You are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. It's a promise. <clears throat> With an oath, by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent or change his mind, thou art a priest for a while. Ever. Oh, forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus was made a surety or an actuality, a truth of a better testament. New Testament based on a promise. All of the New Testament is based on a promise. Verse 23, <clears throat> starting in verse 23, rather, many priests. There were truly many priests because, and this goes to the end of the chapter, they were not suffered to continue by reason of what? Death. Death. They kept dying. It's a problem with the Catholic Church. They don't get it. They make men priests. They die, they have to make them another priest. They die, they make them another priest down through the ages. But Jesus never dies. So why would I want to trust a priest that's going to die instead of the priest that never dies? How can the priest that's going to die make me a promise and keep his word, but the priest who never dies can make a promise and keep his word because he never dies? I mean, it's really a simple proposition. Some of the language makes it sound difficult, but it's not. This man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. So, since Jesus has an unchangeable priesthood, are the rules going to change? Well, then there's no reason for a pope to be writing these new rules. They write them all the time. They're always coming up with something new. They got one now. They're, they're, they're debating about whether to allow for uh, homosexuality and for bishops to be ordained and women to be ordained because, you know, for a long time the women couldn't hold that office, which they shouldn't, according to the Bible. That part's true. But now they're going to change that. The Mormon church, they're always coming up with these presidential, they're president of the Mormon church, the new decree, and they got new laws on top of new laws, just like our government. There are so many laws out there, nobody knows what's going on anymore. We break some of them every day, and there's no way to keep up with it. But Jesus doesn't change. So I know that whatever he said thousands of years ago is still applicable today. So I can remember what he said because he doesn't change it. Aren't you glad? Yes. Don't you wish everybody was? <laughs> so he is able to save to the uttermost from the guttermost to the uttermost. Jesus can save. Doesn't matter who you are, what you've been through. And I, don't, please don't ever. I had a guy tell me, Brother June, I can't get saved. I wish I could get saved. I said, Well, why can't you get saved? He said, Because I'm such a big sinner. You just don't know what a big sinner I am. I said, You know what that sounds like to me? He said, What? I said, Pride. That's all it is. It's not a question of cannot. It's never a question of cannot. It's a matter of will not. You have a choice to make by your will, and you won't make it. You may be afraid. Some people are afraid to make it. Because, oh, well, Jesus might change me. Yeah, he will. He might even call me to preach. He might. <clears throat> I wasn't planning on being a preacher. I doubt Billy was planning on being a preacher. But God didn't give us a choice. <laughs> he just said, this is what you're going to do. That's what it means when we say, God called me to preach. He called. I didn't call. I didn't say, yo, God, I'd like to be a preacher. 
Well, he said, yo, June, you're going to be a preacher. <laughs> but he is able to save. doesn't matter if you're in jail. doesn't matter if you're in a messed up lifestyle, immoral lifestyle. doesn't matter what. Christ can save to them that come to God by him. Come to God by who? Him. him. Who's him? Jesus. Jesus, who is Melchizedek, the priest. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me and giving lots of money to Brother June. <laughs> Some of you don't know how to smile. I don't know what I'm going to do with you. <clears throat> you come to God, he's able to save, but you've got to come to God. Now, what it boils down to this is God calls and God's Holy Spirit draws but you've got to make the choice because you can resist. God can be drawing you to himself and you can say, I ain't going. Sometimes men stand during the invitation in churches holding onto the pew in front of them and they're gripping it so tight their knuckles turn white. I can't go down there. I'll, I'll be embarrassed. I'm a man after all. If I go down there, people are going to make fun of me. What do you mean i got to get baptized? That's for children. No, it's not. Whoever started that rumor? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, the Catholic Church did that too. They started baptizing the babies, mm -hmm. pronouncing them saved. <laughs> Man, I want you to know, if water baptism could save people, I would have a baptistry on wheels. <laughs> and I'd hire Billy to help me, and we'd push that thing up and down the street and grab folks and dunk them. <laughs> Pull them out and say, here's a towel. You're saved. You're on your way to heaven, buddy. <laughs> I'd even try to baptize the devil. If, that's, if that was the case, well, the devil's probably been baptized thousands of times, and all you get every time you pull him up is a wet devil. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I mean, if baptism, and you know, I don't understand the Church of Christ people, they think getting baptized in their baptistry saves you. So why aren't they just grabbing people and dunking them? I don't know. <clears throat> Jesus not only lives forever, but he's constantly making intercession for us. That means he's praying for us. John chapter 17, right before the crucifixion, Jesus was praying and he says, I don't pray just for these, my disciples. I pray also for them that will believe because of their testimony. All the way down generation after generation to us. <clears throat> For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. Jesus is different from us. Now he could have chosen to sin. And sin for Jesus would have been different than you and I. It would have been to use his power independently of the Father while he was on earth. Like Satan said, if you're the son of God, and that word if means since, since you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Could Jesus have done that? Yes. Yeah, he did, but he didn't do it, did he? No. Because the devil knew that if he did that without the father telling him to do that, because Jesus said, I only do always those things which the father tells me to do. That's all. And if he'd have done that, then salvation would have been out the window. All of those tests, that's the whole test that Satan gave Jesus. We don't even get tested like that. Was to act independently of the Father. And Jesus refused. Thank you, Jesus, very much. <clears throat> when he was made on earth, you need to understand, he did not have a human father. There was a specific reason for that. He came to undo all the effects of sin that Adam dragged into the world. Adam was created without a human. He did not have a human father. God was his father. God made him. And so Adam, although he was made by God and he was made perfect, being made perfect, he had a will. He had the capacity to choose, and he chose wrong. Jesus was made, called the second Adam or the last Adam. He was made perfect. He did have the capacity to choose. And all through those 33 and a half years, he never once made a wrong choice. You don't have to make wrong choices. You know why people make wrong choices? 
because they're always in a hurry. We make choices without thinking. We make choices because somebody else said something. We thought it was a cool, so we're going to run off to them. And there's some of these guys making choices to wear their pants down below their butt because somebody else said it was cool, man. I get tickled watching these guys walking across the street like that, you know, because their pants are going to fall down. I said, man, why don't you just put a belt on and be done with it? But no, 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 no. <clears throat> And he was higher than the heavens. God is higher than the heavens. Why? Because he created the heavens. He doesn't need daily to offer offers and sacrifices for sin because he never sinned or for the people because he did this once when he offered himself. The perfect sacrifice. So Jesus is God. He also is the last Adam. And proved as God in the flesh that man could live and make right choices. Now, folks, please don't, don't misunderstand me. We are sinners, but we don't have to sin. We sin because we choose to sin. Oh, well, sometimes we don't really think about it, but we choose to sin. And sometimes I wonder with this old flesh, like Paul said in Romans chapter 7 and 8 when he's talking about himself, he said, the things that I want to do, I can't seem to find the ability to do those things. The things that I don't want to do, I end up doing those things. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he was the greatest apostle that ever lived. He recognized that we do wrong things. We do things we shouldn't do. We do things we don't want to do. And later after we do them, we say, I didn't want to do that. Why did you do that? And it's so hard to undo what you just did. It's like words. You open your mouth and these words come out, and then you think, I shouldn't have said that. Haven't you ever had that experience? <laughs> you know, that was not the right time, place for that. That wasn't kind. And you want to reach out there and grab those words, right? And stick them back in your mouth where they belong, but you can't. They're already out there and everybody done hurt them. For the law makes men priests which have infirmities. They're not perfect. But the word of the oath, the promise, made the son consecrated forevermore. He never changes. He never dies. You can take whatever he says to the bank. And that's why I'm amazed that more people don't read the Bible to find out what he said. You know, it doesn't take that much, especially the New Testament. That's the most important part for us Christians right now. All of it's important, but that's the most important part. If you're just an average reader, you can read the whole New Testament in 16 hours. Just if you're a middle and, you know, to fair reader. If you read the Bible three chapters a day, which takes about 15 minutes, you can read the whole Bible through in one year. You know, I, I just can't read it. Uh, Brother Jr., you just don't understand. I, I try to read the whole Bible through, and, and I got stuck right there where the begats are. I said, well, why didn't you just skip over that? Who cares about those names? Who cares about who was the father of who was the mother of who was the father of who? Who cares, really? Skip over that part. And then you get to the book of Numbers, and they got all these numbering the tribes and all of a sudden. I've read all of every verse of it over and over and over. But skip over the numbers part. Just look through the chapters and numbers until you find something that doesn't have to do with the numbers and read that. Who cares if it was 100,000 or 600,000? It really doesn't make any difference. That's history. Now, if you're a history buff, it's important. And to me, it's important because I find little things in there that help me see a bigger truth. But, you know, don't use that stuff as an excuse and say, well, I just can't do it. I don't read well. When my wife and I got married, I couldn't hardly read at all. I had to teach myself how to read, and she helped because she's smart. Twelve years of college. <laughs> Degree in biology. Only person I ever met that got an A in physics in college twice. 
she was in college and I worked there as a janitor. Now she works for me, I got even. <laughs> Let's stand, every head bowed for just a moment.